and uh, we'll have a roll call. Good afternoon again. Sorry. Um, Sorry yes, about that. this is this is um, the March meeting of the HRM Active Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, we are, will begin with a call to order. That's this, uh, and the roll call. Uh, my name is Hugh Millward. I am currently the chair of the committee. Um, Douglas Wetmore is the vice chairperson. Can you introduce yourself, Douglas? Absolutely, Douglas Wetmore here. Thank you, Hugh, vice chair of the active vice chair of the Active Transportation Advisory Committee. Thank you. Yes, we're just checking everyone's uh, camera and uh, audio. So uh, let's just go through the rest of the, the attendees. Uh, Annika Ropel, can you identify Hi. yourself? Hi, Hi Annika. Accounted for. Holly Woodhill. Hello, I'm here. I'm representing Trails. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Uh, Milena Casanovicius. Still here representing walkability. <laughs> Thank you, Milena. Elizabeth Pugh. Yes, I'm here representing the province of Nova Scotia. Thank, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Peter Zimmer. Here. Yep. Okay, Peter. Is Paul Young here? Yes, yes. Hello. Hi. Paul Young is here. Hello, Paul. Hi, Paul. Thank you. I believe that's it for the attendees. Uh, we've had regrets from Councillor Patty Cottell, from Brittany McLean, Miles McCormick, and Andrew Taylor. Staff members at this meeting, um, our legislative assistant is Elizabeth McDonald. Uh, Chloe Kennedy Hello. from Active Transportation, are you here? Chloe Kennedy? She is in the meeting, yeah, so um, okay. Okay. I don't know if she can. Uh, hopefully she'll join uh, us shortly. Also, yes, David Can you folks hear me? Oh. No, we can hear you now. Yes, hello, Chloe. We can oh. see and hear you. Thank you. Okay, sorry. I'm experiencing quite a bit of a lag. Okay. I can't do much about that. I hope Elizabeth can. Yeah, no, sorry, just, just to give you a heads up. <laughs> okay, um, so we have Chloe. Uh, David McKaiser, manager of active transportation, uh, should be joining us in a little while, hopefully. So to proceed, uh, I'll read the land acknowledgement. Uh, the Halifax Regional Municipality is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. The municipality acknowledges the peace and friendship treaties signed in this territory and recognizes that we are all treaty people. We'll move on then to approval of the minutes uh, from uh, the January 19th meeting. These were circulated. I'll call for a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Someone? Peter, thank you. Uh, um, and I, I can second. Thank you, Annika. Annika seconded. Uh, are there any issues uh, that anyone wants to, wants to raise with the minutes? Hearing none, I'll call for the question. Those in favor of, of, uh, of approving the minutes, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Aye. And anyone opposed, please say nay or raise your hand. Okay, then we can declare that the motion is carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, next is approval of the order of business and approval of, of any additions or deletions. Um, so I'll first ask Elizabeth, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? There are no additions or deletions. Okay, thank you. Uh, then I'll call for a motion to approve the agenda, the order of business as circulated. I need a mover and a seconder. I'll mute for you, Hugh, Holly here. Thank, thank and you. And I can second that. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Um, so we'll move on to uh, the question. And those in favor of approval, 
say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Thank you. And anyone opposed, say nay or raise your hand. None opposed, so that's uh, the order of business approved as circulated. Um, item four is business arising out of the minutes, and there is none. Item five is a call for declaration of conflict of interests, of interest. Uh, if there are any conflicts of interest that you would like to declare, self-declare, um, regarding the, the agenda, please declare it now. Okay, so there are no conflicts of interest. Thank you. Uh, item six, consideration of deferred business. Again, there is none. Item seven is correspondence. Elizabeth, has there been any correspondence received through the clerk's office? There has been no correspondence received through the clerk's office. Okay, thank you. And uh, petitions, um, again, uh, either Elizabeth or committee members, if you you've had any petitions that you wish to bring forward, um, are there any? There are no petitions from the clerk's office. Okay, and I don't hear any others. So that's fine, we can move on to uh, item, there aren't, item seven, there's no presentations. Item eight, um, items brought forward, there are none. And we can move on to the three substantive items uh, for today, uh, reports and discussion. So firstly, we have a staff update on projects and plans. Um, and I believe Chloe Kennedy is going to give that. Chloe? Hi, folks. Uh, hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. Good. So David McIsaac is going to be delivering some additional updates. Uh, he did send his regrets that he's going to be about 20 minutes late. Um, so he'll be popping in soon. Um, but he did ask that I give a bit of a, an update on the AAA Regional Centre Network. So I put together some slides for an event that we hosted uh, in November that it was intended to provide a very high level view of the projects that are coming down the line in 2023, because it is going to be a pretty big construction year. A lot of our projects are kind of coming together this year. Um, so I thought uh, there was interest from the uh, committee in having a bit of a presentation. So um, I'm just gonna share a few slides to help with the update. Bear with me here. <laughs> okay. Um, can folks see my screen okay? Uh, yes, although it doesn't appear to be full screen. Yeah, we're get, I think we're getting your view, like your, the present presenter view. Oh. <laughs> if you're able to put it in presenter view, Um, how's that? There you go. That's better. Okay. All right. Well, good. So this will just take like 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, it's just an update on kind of the regional center to date, kind of where we've been, where we're going. And um, then David will hop in after I'm finished to provide some additional updates that were requested by the ATAC committee. So just really quick, I'll give a super quick intro, uh, look at some of the progress that we've had to date on the cycling network, and then what's coming in 2023 and beyond. That's really the meat of it and what we're uh, really aiming to communicate with folks this year as we sort of move into uh, construction season. So our team will be doing more and more of this over the next couple of months. And then if there's any questions and discussion, of course, we can uh, have a few minutes for that. So especially for this group, you don't need too much of an overview of who we are. Uh, the active transportation team is, of course, part of the public works department alongside our engineering and surveying colleagues. Um, the direction for the AAA network, of course, comes from the integrated mobility plan, um, which aims to have residents provided with a choice of connected, healthy and affordable travel options. 
Um, the type of facilities that we're focusing on building in Halifax in the regional center, which is um, Halifax and Dartmouth, is local street bikeways, of course, which is diverting and slowing down traffic on local streets to make it a more comfortable environment for sharing, protected bike lanes with physical buffers, or off-street pathways or multi-use pathways. Um, the images to the left, you can see uh, shared use lanes on major streets or painted bike lanes or even buffered bike lanes are not uh, considered appropriate for people of all ages and abilities. So just a very quick um, kind of refresher for folks. Uh, our group at Active Transportation Planning is responsible for the really high level designs of the bike lanes. So we uh, call that functional planning. If you think of 100% of the design being finished as being you know, ready to send off to the construction crews, we do uh, the 30% designs, which again are higher level um, based on some public and stakeholder engagement. We look at options, uh, talk to some of the utilities, provide cost estimates, and then have to get council approval. So in the integrated mobility plan, that was part of the deal, that we talk to the public and we get council approval for each segment of the regional network. So after we're finished our functional planning, then we pass it along to the preliminary design group and they take it up to 60% design. So they buy land that needs buying, they do more survey work, more design work. And then the detailed design happens where we finish the drawings, complete the land acquisition, look at the really nitty gritty details like signal timing, and then provide the final cost estimates and the final designs before handing them off to the construction crews. So all of the projects that we're going to see today that are going to be built in 2023 have gone through all of these stages over the past few years. And then of course our maintenance and operation is ongoing. So the update... Sorry to interrupt the... Chloe, um, if you're just oh, before you start on that next slide there, are you able to just hide that um, bar at the at the bottom? Oh, where... sorry, I didn't realize you... Oh. Uh, that's that great, better? thank you. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Okay, no, thank you for that. So by the end of 2023, as we're gonna chat about in a few minutes here, uh, the cycling network will be about 60% complete. Um, so the new timeline to finish up all the final kind of segments of the network does extend to 2028. Uh, we have to integrate with certain other, you know, parks planning projects and roadwork projects. So we're not exactly sure on when that will happen. Um, so because of that, we did give ourselves a few extra years to finish up the final segments. Uh, we are going to be making some accelerated progress this year via the interim bikeway improvements that's been in the planning process for a few years and is coming to fruition in 2023. So looking back, um, we thought it would be fun just to go through kind of where we've come from, where we're going. When the integrated mobility plan was approved, um, God, five years ago, going on six in 2023, uh, the AAA infrastructure that we had consisted of multi-use pathways. So, you know, we had the Harborfront Greenway going along the Dartmouth water there, the Lake Benook multi-use pathway that goes along the lake, Highfield Park Drive Greenway that takes folks into Burnside, and the Chain of Lakes Trail for the most part. In 2018, uh, the Woodside multi-use pathway extension was built. So that was intended to carry folks from Alderney Landing kind of up through Woodside, um, into Baker Drive and those Dartmouth neighborhoods. Also the Ahern multi-use pathway was built uh, kind of between the Commons and Citadel Hill. And also the Sexton Campus AT corridor was built uh, down in the south end of Halifax. So that's all in 2018. 2019 was a big year for construction. We had the local street bikeways along Vernon Street and Allen Street. The first phase of the South Park protected bike lane went in in 2019. So that was from Spring Garden down to uh, Young. The Hollis Street phase one protected bike lanes went in also in 2019 and the Barrington Street Greenway extension. So that's kind of off street multi-use pathway along Barrington Street. In 2020, that was also a big year for construction. Uh, the South Park bike lanes kind of the second phase uh, between Spring Garden and Sackville were constructed that year. And that during that phase, the whole road was torn up and the raised level bike lanes were put in. We also put in the signals at Vernon and Coburg. So that's, having been a Dal alumni myself, a pretty tricky intersection to navigate whether you're driving, biking, or walking. Um, so a half signal was put in and pavement markings and radar to try to help cyclists and pedestrians, especially 
get from Vernon Street down uh, Seymour into the Dell campus. Um, and also the Penhorn Lake, a little multi-use pathway up uh, near Graham's Grove. 2021 saw the uh, Wise Road protected bike lanes. Uh, so that was just construction season before last. Uh, the Dahlia in Dartmouth uh, project went in. Um, that's a local street bikeway. The Lehman Isleville local street bikeway in the north end of Halifax. Also the Allen Oak signal. So if anyone goes down um, Oxford Street, if any, you know, as folks know, even driving was tricky to kind of get through that intersection as you do have quite a bit of traffic on Oxford. So this was intended to make it um, safer for folks to make that transition between local streets across Oxford Street. And then the uh, Bayers Road multi-use pathway was also built in 2021. 2022, just this past year, um, if anyone has tried to bike to the Chain of Lakes Trail from the Bayers Road multi-use pathway, you have to kind of find your way through local streets and it's, you know, not the best connection, especially up um, Elliott Street. So uh, improvements were made at the intersection of kind of the Chain of Lakes Trail and Exit Zero. Um, pedestrian islands being widened, cross rides being put in. So that's intended to make that connection better from West End Halifax to the Chain of Lakes Trail. Uh, we also had the um, local street bikeway that kind of extends from that intersection down to the Bears Road multi-use pathway. Uh, Dahlia Street phase two was finished up in Dartmouth and also the Cogswell kind of tactical multi-use pathway was put in. Um, I myself bike quite a bit from South End, North End, Halifax, and that has made quite a difference for folks um, traveling between those. It hasn't always been the best conditions uh, before this multi-use pathway was installed. And it is, of course, tactical. It's not the permanent design. Once the Cogswell interchange project is completed, it will include uh, bike lanes, multi-use pathways to make those nice connections. But until that's finished, we have a multi-use pathway. So as of kind of December 2022, after construction season, we're at about 45% complete with a whole whack of projects coming in 2023. So that's what we're really excited to update folks on. So the planned construction for 2023 includes the Almond Street bike lanes at long last uh, from Windsor Street to Agricola. So those are gonna be unidirectional bike lanes. Um, there was some property acquisition um, and also construction encroachments um, that had slowed down that project quite a bit, but uh, as much as possible to build right now with that encroachment, um, they will be constructed this year. Also, if anyone takes the Dartmouth Waterfront Trail, kind of starting at Alderley Landing and going along the waterfront, uh, you kind of have to bike like along a parking lot right now between two sort of uh, multi-unit residential buildings. So we were able to um, acquire some land through there, just kind of finalizing that agreement and then uh, construction is slated for this year. Also the uh, permanent rehabilitation of Isleville between Duffus and Young will take place kind of putting a big chunk in place of the North End Bikeway project. Also, we'll have the Hollis Street uh, to Terminal Road. Actually, this was constructed last month. So that's, uh, if you're at the Superstore, kind of downtown Halifax off of Barrington, there's now protected bike lanes that run from Barrington, kind of in front of the Westin, and then down um, to connect to Lower Water Street. So that's filling in a little bit of the gap in South End Halifax. We also have the Allen Oak local street bikeway extension. So that will extend the existing bikeway um, down to Connaught. And we also have the interim bikeway improvements project. So this is quite a big project that again has been a few years in the making behind the scenes, but is uh, ready for construction this year. Uh, so the interim tactical bikeways um, that's kind of made of temporary materials. So these streets aren't being rehabilitated yet, but we're gonna come in with, you know, bollards, curb extensions, speed tables to improve some of these corridors before that uh, major rehabilitation happens. So Slater Street is partially completed as of now. It received speed tables, but we'll be getting some curb extensions and sharrows painted on uh, this spring. And there's also gonna be a functional planning project happening for Slater Street to get some feedback on those permanent, uh, to get feedback for the permanent street design. Also, uh, we're gonna have the Northwood Creighton, Fuller Maynard, right on the heart of the peninsula. That's part of the North End Bikeways project. That's also gonna be receiving some speed tables, curb extensions, uh, pavement markings to improve uh, conditions for folks 
who are cycling through that area. Liverpool Street as well, which is a nice connection uh, that will be made from, Al or sorry, from Windsor Street down to the um, Bears Road multi-use pathway, kind of West End Halifax. Also, the Bell Road bike lanes will be um, completed with bollards, flexible bollards. So this past year in 2022, uh, the bike lanes were repainted to be wider with some conflict markings put in. You'll have to have some, some touch-ups come the spring, but it will be getting uh, bollards installed um, as a tactical measure. And finally, Devonshire Street up in the north end, connecting the existing uh, multi-use pathway on Barrington Street up to the uh, Isleville local street bikeway. So that will also be completed and that will have precast curbs and also flexible bollards. Ah, so that's a lot of construction happening this year. Uh, just a bit of information for folks about the interim and tactical bikeways. Uh, this project essentially allows for a faster implementation and the ability to kind of trial some street designs on a temporary basis before we rehabilitate the entire street and make it permanent and uh, spend a whack of money on it. It also allows time to monitor the project impacts and gather feedback um, to influence the permanent design. So especially on the North End bike lane and the Slater Street bike lane where there is functional planning still ahead of us, uh, that's going to be an important feature. And if folks would like to read more about the implementation of the interim bikeway improvements that are coming this year, uh, you can visit our website. It's halifax.ca slash interim bikeways. And this is just a screen capture of what that web page looks like. You've got a ton of information, maps, and some contact info as well. So some upcoming projects that we have kind of in 2024 and beyond. These are a few of the priority projects. So we have Dartmouth North, which is going to be Highfield Park Drive and Victoria Road. The McDonald Bridge bikeways uh, on the Halifax side. So there's um, some more design work happening there. Uh, the West End bikeways and Brunswick Street Phase 1, which just went to council earlier this year, uh, which will extend down Brunswick Street to Spring Garden. So I know that's a ton of information, and I'm certainly not uh, the expert on every single one of these projects, as they're led by, you know, a multitude of different staff members. But this was, you know, intended as kind of a high-level update on some of the construction that's going to be happening this year, and a bit of an update on the status of the network itself. Um, yeah, so if anyone has any questions or um, comments for David and I, uh, has David made it into the meeting? Uh, yes, David's yes, now in the Matt. meeting. All right. Hi, David. Yeah. Uh, David, do you have anything to add to Chloe's presentation? Uh, no. No? I, I, <laughs> I saw probably the last five minutes of it, so uh, that would... Okay. Uh, Okay. Thank you. So uh, let's just go through the speaking list to give everyone a chance to uh, ask questions or make comments. Um, I'll just go through the list. Uh, Paul Young? Questions um, or comments? No, I, I think this is great. Uh, lot, uh, it, I think that the view that you gave us that showed um, that showed the progress over time, I think is really valuable to remind us how much has been done and, and where we're going. I think it's great. Um, uh, I'm new to the committee, um, I, and I get that there's a, a huge focus on the peninsula, um, but I'd, I'd, I'd also like, you know, and I, I don't want to derail the direction of that it's going. I think it's going in a really great direction, but some of us in the suburbs would, would like to see a little love uh, sometime uh, down the road. Yes, absolutely. And there's certainly a number of projects going on um, also. So this was kind of, you know, the the regional center AAA network. There's been quite a bit of, um, you know, discussion generated around this as we did, you know, originally back in 2016, 2017, aim to have it installed uh, by 2022. And, uh, you know, we're not there, but we're getting there. Um, but certainly, um, you know, projects that are going on outside the peninsula. I know David can speak to that and some of the kind of high level priorities that were identified in the active transportation plan and the sort of larger plan for, uh, for the whole municipality. Okay, thank you. Um, Douglas Wetmore, do you have any questions or concerns? Um, yeah, I'm just opening up the website that you mentioned here, um, reading through some of the extra content on here. And I guess the only question I have based on what I'm reading here is there's mentions of a handful of engagement sessions. Specifically, I noticed one for Bell Road. 
is that information going to be that going to be coming soon? Yeah. So the um, Siobhan uh, Witherby and Mark Neener are going to be leading the Midtown Bikeway uh, Planning Project. So that's that project has already gone through its first phase of consultation. Um, and that kind of looked at some of the area around the Commons and Bell Road and even up into Quinpool. So they're going to be launching the second round of public engagement for that project uh, in May or June. Bit of a Perfect. bit of a moving target, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll certainly keep the ATAC folks updated on the um, on when that project goes, and they'll you know be blasting over Facebook and social media when the survey is live, and when we'll be hosting their uh, you know pop up engagements and public meetings and that kind of thing. Yeah, um, the only other thing I want to comment on is I noticed that the Bell Road uh, interim bike lanes are listed as temporary for over the winter, where they will be removed and downgraded back to painted, which is a little unfortunate to see I considering know. that's a pretty big connection, but hopefully that's something that maybe we could find some other solutions around. Definitely. Yeah. That's certainly not the ideal, um, you know, design from our perspective either. It's certainly, you know, a bit of a trade-off with the um, street and road operations group, you know, where there's snow clearing issues and, you know, some pretty constrained right of way, um, through that area, if you are to have unidirectional bike lanes, um, you know, enough room for emergency vehicles to get through in both directions and keeping those nice trees and curbs on the side. Um, David, I'm not sure if you have anything to add on the Bell Road kind of design or solution moving forward. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just add that it's um, our snow plows, our, you know, our, our plows for clearing bike lanes can go as narrow as 1.7 meters. And because of the, the, what the space we have to work with on Bell Road, we can't get that width. Um, so that's one of the reasons. Yeah, and, and then I guess even, it, you know, you know, even if we could squeeze them in, anytime you combine a snowplow with a bollard directly attached into the asphalt, it's very susceptible to damage. <laughs> Um, we do okay on Rainy Drive and we do okay on University because they're in a buffer, but uh, on Bell Road and then the other one like that is Wise Road um, north of Boland where three C. You're, you're cutting out a little there, but I get your point. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Are you still there, David? Uh, I am. I'm going to oh, try okay. to reconnect here. Oh, okay, fine. There's there's no other questions from me in the meantime, Hugh. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Thank well, you for that well, one. Certainly, like, it isn't an ideal, uh, you know, design with just the flexible bollards. So that's, uh, yeah, ongoing work for sure. Okay. Well, thank you, Douglas. Uh, Annika Ropel. Yeah, hi. I, I I think it is always nice to see those um, those maps to give us that uh, that perspective because sometimes it feels like things are moving very slow, but they are in fact moving uh, very fast. And the pandemic certainly threw some curveballs in there. Um, so kudos to you and your team. I know you guys work hard. Um, I guess my only big question was uh, around signage, specifically getting out to some of those rail to trails. I know that's been a thing that's been brought up in the past. Is there a timeline on, on that and, and the, the, like a, a, a signage conversation? Yeah, so I'm uh, leading the Active Transportation Wayfinding Pilot Project. So that was work that started um, before I joined the team, but there was... Um, work with Bicycle Nova Scotia who designed this wayfinding guide. Um, so if you look at the, or, you know, look up the Nova Scotia um, Bicycle Wayfinding Guide that was created by, uh, primarily by Bicycle Nova Scotia. And it looked at some of the, you know, designs from Vancouver and, you know, some kind of best practices around sign placement and height. So uh, back in 2019, before the pandemic, uh, a few of the AT staff members engaged with some trails groups and some of the public to, look at areas that would be good candidates to kind of try out some of this wayfinding signage along active transportation routes. And we basically just took the design straight from that guide and then used them in terms of, you know, the color and the placement and the height um, and installed them along the way, the mainland north um, trail. 
And also they're installed on the Chain of Lakes Trail. Uh, they're installed at Alderney Landing in downtown Dartmouth. Um, and also uh, they'll be coming on the um, Vernon Local Street Bikeway. So those were kind of the pilot sites that were identified and now have been installed. And we had a little public survey open and I'm working on a final report now that will kind of look at recommendations for how to expand that project throughout um, the rest of you know Halifax, Dartmouth, especially for getting folks to the major destinations. So um, there's gonna be wayfinding signage installed at the, we have designs and they've already been printed and they're gonna be installed shortly um, along the local street bikeway leading from the Bears Road multi-use pathway to the chain of lakes. Cause especially in talking to people, like you wouldn't know you're like on Bears Road going past the shopping center. And you know, a lot of folks don't know. They're just like, oh, the pathway just seems to end at that bridge that goes over the um, rail cut. But uh, so yeah, we all have some signage coming there to direct people to the Chain of Lakes pathway. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly trying to, to get better at that. Um, so we asked in our public survey, you know, what are some areas that people think could use more signage? You know, whether you're new to Halifax or even just kind of getting more interested in navigating the city by bike. Um, so if there's any areas that people are particularly concerned about, I'm a great person to talk to about that. Uh, my email is here if anyone wants to reach out and kind of chat a bit more about the wayfinding project. But that's a bit of an update on kind of where things stand. Hey, thank and I you. did I also, oh, I also Sorry. just wanted to just big, big shout out to the tactical infrastructure. It's really cool to see that um, moving forward. I think it's a great way of engaging with the community um, while also putting in speed bumps. So just for the record. Oh, Thumbs great. Up. Thank you. Yeah, it's been it's been a, a few years coming. Certainly the the curveball thrown by the pandemic um, didn't help things. But yeah, we're we're very happy that it's finally coming along and it's going to fill in some of those major gaps in the AAA network. OK, thank you, Annika. Yeah. I, I see that Elizabeth Pugh has her hand up. Elizabeth? Yes, I just wanted to let Chloe know you're probably aware of this, but I I'm a frequent user of the Colt Trail, and almost all the wayfinding signs have been taken off. The blue root piece is still there, but the wayfinding ones are gone. So um, I don't know if there's a better design that's less vandalizable um, that could be used yeah. or, or what. I don't know what's going on. It's very odd. Personally, I think the blue root I, ones should have been taken, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's 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 tricky because we had them on those, you know, on the the metal posts that were installed, um, kind of just direct embedment so that they could be moved around since it was a pilot project. But yeah, some of them have suspiciously gone missing. So that's um, yeah, something that we'll have to look at trying to see if we can get them fastened on there better. Um, but yeah, thanks for for the heads up there. We have heard okay. a few other accounts of that as well and are looking into it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, did you have other comments, uh, Elizabeth? Elizabeth? No, I didn't. Thank you very much for the presentation, though. It's, I love seeing the, uh, you know, year after year uh, improvements like that. It's great. Great. Keep it Thank up. You. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Elizabeth. Holly Woodhill. Holly. Yes. Um, basically, trails folks want all the bikeways connected to trails. Uh, if, Definitely. especially if they're active transportation trails, um, but the other ones as well. And just as a heads up, the ATVs, motorized group, want access mm -hmm. to all the rail trails. Yes, this is certainly a hot topic issue in the trails uh, groups. I'm not involved um, as directly with the trails groups, but certainly, you know, some of the spots in Dartmouth have some ongoing kind of tough conversations around uh, trail users. And yeah, there's a, there is going to be a connection to the Shearwater Flyer Trail uh, along Pleasant Street. And David's been involved in that project. And certainly, you know, there's been a lot of you know, pressure on our team to really get this um, AAA network implemented. So that has been where we've been allocating a lot of our staff time. But, you know, also our team does work on projects outside the regional center and the suburbs linking to trails. So as we kind of wrap up a lot of these projects in the regional center, we're going to be focusing more and more on these kind of connections. But certainly some of the major ones um, like the Shearwater Flyer connection and uh, the Chain of Lakes connection and even the mainland north uh, connecting to the Dunbrack Greenway there. Uh, but there's a lot more gaps and certainly a lot more work to do. Um, yeah, and more conversations to be had around the the motorized trail uh, users. I'm not sure if David has any other comments he'd like to make on that piece. It's been a big one this year. 
It is my number one least favorite file and topic. Um, we put that in it's minutes. And, uh, you know, basically HRM has no direction around ATVs or motorized and is very much driven by provincial interests. And we struggle to put active transportation front and center um, often. And we also struggle with, you know, we want certain corridors to be accessible to everybody. And uh, it's a little bit of a dance. But uh, anyway, we're doing our best for active transportation and also doing our best in terms of working with other jurisdictions. Okay, thank you, David. <clears throat> um, I see Paul Young's got his hand up, but uh, I, let's finish going through the list and, let's, and then get back to Paul. Is that okay? Uh, Milena Casanovicius. Thank you, Hugh. Yes. Hi, Chloe. Thanks for coming back out. You can blame me for dragging you out here this evening. No, this is great. <laughs> it's happy to be here. Uh, I thought it would be important for the rest of the committee to hear what yes. I heard in the meeting. I'm not going to give you my violin song, but I would like for the for the record for this committee to understand, as I wrote in the conversation and discussion before this meeting came to be, um, my grievances. I, I want this this committee and the AT team to remember that we are under the integrated mobility plan, meaning pedestrians, cyclists, buses, um, vehicles. Right now at this point, as a person with a disability who's completely blind, I don't see that happening. I'm seeing cycling lanes going above and beyond pedestrian safety. And that is really bothering me. One, I am a pedestrian who's blind. My alternatives are walking or bus. With the proper talk and a little bit of blackmail, I can get someone to be my pilot on my tandem, okay? And what is happening with the bike lanes, while you 100% understand and many of your colleagues are still parts of the teams of AT who are not getting it or refusing to do so. Some of the bike lanes that are being put in, and, and, and again, this is more to the, to the committee rather than, than to, 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 to Chloe and, and, and David. Raised bike lanes are great. I like them myself, but they, you, they need to stop to be raised while going across an intersection um, or a crosswalk, meaning South Park, Wise Road, which we beg not to do so. They're very difficult for people who are blind or partially sighted. There are too many tactile markers and therefore it leads us to be walking down the bike lanes, just so the committee understands. And for somebody who needs a little bit further explanation, um, feel free to email me as well. Um, you know, some of the infrastructure is just not feasible for people who do not see. Second, um, I, I, I really want to commend for all the hard work you're doing. I, I think from your team, particularly Chloe, you, you've been out there really promoting and asking and, and getting people involved. Um, and from the other, the other end, I, I have a question. What would be the problem? Because quite a few of my cycling friends who are cited, obviously, are asking why can we not do, you know, some of what New York, New Jersey has done um, and intermittently placing Jersey borders. They're easy to place. A car is not going to drive over them, you, you, you know, and, and the bikes will be protected within that area instead of these bollards that are, you know, falling over or whatever the case and, and interfering in, in the bike lanes. So, but what, why not try, you know, Jersey borders intermittently where a car, if they're going to try and run you over as, as a, a cyclist, they're not going to mm. succeed. Yeah, the Jersey barrier certainly add another another level. Um, David, do you have any any comment on that? Um, they're cheap. To I make. would be <laughs> what I have liked, what I've seen, and what I would like to try here in a few places. I think they're called airport barriers. They're kind of like halfway between the Jersey barriers and the precast concrete curb that we have now. Okay. Um, you know, it's, I think it probably depends on the context, you know, what kind of street it is and, and what the other kind of conflicting uses are. Um, I have not seen, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, I hear what you're saying, um, 
but uh, I'll take that back to the team. Okay. Well, and, and just one last comment, just yeah. pertaining to, because again, go you know pedestrian cycling bus vehicle, and it, this isn't the AT's um, problem. This is this is council and 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 the city and uh, well in the province, right? I don't see traffic slowing down. We're, we're still catering to vehicular traffic and it's really bothersome. And I felt having gone from my fifth training in New York and New Jersey with my guide dog and returning at Christmas um, with hope it, that I felt much safer in New York and Jersey, plain and simple, because the culture I'm just going to pause on uh, I, oh. things. I, I just, I'm sorry, I see, because when we're typing in the chat boxes, it's going to my ear. So, so just to, just to finish off my thought was that in New York and New Jersey, well, it's bumper to bumper traffic because the lighted intersections are everywhere and people are aware of pedestrians. Not once mm. did I get hit, run over or anything of the sort, unlike here. We're, we're just, you know, and again, this is not your, not your fault, but I, I think we can do a lot better and I don't know, fight against the, the cars and, and put in infrastructure to protect bikes and pedestrians above and beyond. Mm. End of thought. Okay. Yes. Thank you for that. That's really, uh, yep. yeah, it's certainly an interesting dynamic right now with the kind of where we're at in terms of this, you know, change management and trying to evolve as a city in terms of how we, you know, think about the interactions between cars and pedestrians and cyclists, you know, I think in the last few decades, it's been drivers are pretty used to having parking wherever they want, being able to go, you know, pretty snappy where they need to go. And we're really trying to Shifting that that mindset is really uh, something that New Yorkers have had to deal with just because of sheer population density, right? So it's yeah. uh, we're getting there, hopefully. <laughs> well, and our population that, density that is, has grown. Yes, it's it's growing, yes, it's going, exactly. and it's and we need and we need to slow them down. So anyway, David, please 100%. do take that to the team about about um, the airport. That's a new term for me. Airport, Jersey borders, or whatever you call them. That's great. End of thought. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you, Melina. Thank you, Melina. Um, Peter Zimmer, Peter Zimmer. Hi. Um, I'll take an even broader view than Melania does. If we want to really make the streets, all the streets, safer for pedestrians, safer for cyclists, without doing a hell of a lot of building, we could ask the province to let us turn all of the speed limits on all of the city streets down by about 20 kilometers an hour. It not only would improve public health at all levels, it would reduce the amount of crashes, the severity of crashes, and it would very quickly, if it was enforced the way Edmonton enforces their new lower speed limits uh, with photo radar speed ticketing, um, people learned within a year to drive the speed limit in Edmonton, and you know, it's not a, it's not rocket science. It's there. It's in practice in a lot of other countries, a lot of other places. Um, you know, go to Edmonton. Ask them what they did and how they did it. Uh, it would take a bit of cooperation from the province, which I realize is a whole huge monster. But frankly, I wish, you know. I wish somehow we could translate some of the planning energy with physical infrastructure into planning the social changes of slowing people down. That's the first and biggest thing we can do as advocates for active transportation. Slow the damn cars down and make speeders pay and let them pay seriously. Let them pay with a graduated uh, history. I mean, the, the radar system will keep track of who's got three tickets, four tickets, five tickets. And if after the second or third ticket, they start doubling at every future instance, they're going to be a hell of a lot of people learning. I mean, it's, it's you know, and the carrot will be that they'll actually find that they get to work in about the same number of hours. You know, that certain people will decide, oh, I'd rather take a bus 
than drive a car at 35 kilometers an hour maximum. Uh, okay, Peter, thank you. Uh, I'm sure we can all agree with you, um, but uh, safety and, and with Milena, that safety is the key. Um, I, we've just, uh, let's see, we have gone through the speaker list, or have we? Um, uh, Andrew Taylor me. is also um, in the meeting now, and he wasn't on the speakers list because we initially had him down as he had sent his regrets. But oh. if you wanted to call upon him as well, um, he is present in the meeting. I have been comment. Ah, hello. Uh, did, you, did you have comments? I'm sorry. No, I didn't. Nothing. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'll just make, have a quick comment myself. Um, and I, I appreciated the maps that showed the development of the system through time, uh, the bikeway system. But um, even sections in Dartmouth were, weren't shown. For example, the Portland Hills, uh, the Portland Lakes uh, multi-use path, uh, which connects all the way down to uh, to um, Woodside, that wasn't shown. Um, and of course, there's ones that were off the map area, such as the Forest Hills uh, multi-use path as well. So I think it is important that um, the the suburbs get served and 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 shown, uh, you know, in publicity and so on, just as much as the inner city area. Uh, that's that's my pet beef, if you like. <laughs> that's um, Paul Young, you still have your hand up. Did you have further comments? Uh, yeah, I did. I wanted to go back to, to, to David's comment about his uh, least favorite file. I can understand that um, <laughs> being uh, active transportation versus um, uh, motorized transportation on those trails. Um, I'm relatively new here. I don't know if the active transportation committee has uh, made a statement uh, on what it thinks uh, um, uh, about uh, motorized vehicles on those trails in the HRM. Um, but I, I, if we haven't, then I think that we should have a discussion, put it on record, and at least David got the whole committee behind him. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I'd, I'd like to thank Chloe and David for their presentation. And, and um, it certainly looks as though we can expect a lot of activity this year and uh, connections, uh, interconnections uh, within the network, which is excellent. Um, let's move on now to um, our second uh, presentation, which is from Annika Ropel. Uh, she'll be giving an update on active transportation projects uh, from the Ecology Action Center. Annika? Hi, everyone. And I'm going to do the same thing, which is bear with me while I attempt to share my screen. Uh, <laughs> um, unless, Elizabeth, is that something you can do because I sent you those slides? Or is it better if I do it myself? Um, so I'm currently on as the, the co-host. Okay. Um, I believe Krista would have the um, the ability to do that. Um, if you're actually, if you're able to share them yourself, that might be that might be yep. easiest. Let me go. There we go. And then I want to do. Present. Sorry, everyone. It's, this is the joys. I think slideshow should be should be the right one there. No. Nope. How are we doing? There you go. Y'all yep. seeing what I'm seeing? Perfect. Um, yep. Great. Well, um, first, uh, thanks everyone. I, I, um, I know many folks here know some pieces of this information, um, and and so I don't want to consume too much of people's time. Um, but I figured if there was space today, it might be worth doing a really quick, brief kind of you know, where where the EAC is in terms of our policy work and our programming in 2023. Um, I think sometimes people know bits and pieces of the work we do. Um, so I will try to be succinct and fast, but I also have a habit of ranting on. So, Paul, so uh, I'm 
trying to rein it in. Um, yeah, so uh, Annika Riopel, I'm uh, with the Ecology Action Center. Um, currently, I am uh, mostly working on our policy work. Uh, and so Paul and uh, Holly and other folks, uh, there's, there is all the work being done in the background and I'll uh, ring, rope you in to, to chat about uh, all of those pieces around uh, and and uh, Peter like uh, speed ticket uh, or uh, speed limit reductions um, and all that uh, jazz. So it is um, uh, work that I think sometimes gets done in the background and people aren't aware of. But we're yelling at the people in the province about uh, those changes and they are slow to get moving. So um, I'll come back to that. Uh, yeah, so really quickly, EAC uh, has been around since 1972. Uh, we just had our 50th anniversary. Um, our work spans broadly from food, energy, transportation, marine, coastal. Um, and so our mandate and um, vision, mission, values are really broad um, ranging in terms of um, what our work is, but then also how we apply that to transportation within the transportation team. And so, um, yeah, uh, for Milena's sake, uh, the vision of the EAC that we've just updated this is a just and vibrant world of respect, belonging and ecological resilience. Um, and we see ourselves as a watchdog, conveyor, mobilizer, incubator, um, engaging the community to create systemic change in the face of urgent, complex and environmental issues. Um, I'm gonna jump over the values. So yeah, how we bring that into our work. Um, I usually, this is a slide from a long time ago that I look at now and I'm like, Ugh, I could, make this jazzier, but um, so again, that work around sustainable transportation, which includes walking, rolling, biking, um, scooters um, and transit, um, uh, which is something we don't always talk a lot about, but again, a piece that we're working on right now. So I believe the current stat is that 10% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions is personal vehicle use and transportation or transit systems in improving them and paying our bus drivers a living wage would go a very long way of making that number change. Um, so we're working on that uh, piece with a couple other national players. Um, oftentimes when I talk about uh, biking and walking and active transportation, I think, you know, there's lots of different factors in there. Uh, it's an affordable way of getting around uh, the physical and cognitive well-being indicators. Um, but then this piece that I really like a lot, which is um, a sense of belonging in the community. And so we've been doing lots of work with newcomers over the years. And one of the studies is that um, newcomers who feel like they belong in their community um, have better physical and cognitive uh, health indicators. And uh, the Bike Buddy program that we're working with in partnership with Toronto and Vancouver um, are demonstrating that newcomers who start riding have deeper senses of belonging in their community. Um, and, you know, if I was to um, go out on a limb, I would say that that's probably people who walk and bike around their community. Um, I would say that's probably not just newcomers. Um, so that's a, a really big piece of, of what also influences our work, which is building community and um, senses of belonging. So yeah. The way we really started framing our work is about reducing barriers through programming and partnerships. Um, so meeting people where they're at um, and trying to understand what are what are the actual barriers, if it's infrastructure or are there uh, safety concerns or are there other barriers that we're not aware of. And so uh, that is how we've uh, framing our work and building things that are um, programs and work that is adaptable so that we can tailor it to groups um, and meet them where they are instead of trying to force everyone through a square hole. Um, so that's a big piece. Um, foundational to the majority of our cycling work, uh, although also our walking work, um, is Making Tracks, which was originally created in partnership with St. FX uh, with their teaching program. And it was very focused at, on youth. Um, we're still trying to get this one into the curriculum. Um, and making it mandatory that all children in Nova Scotia learn safe cycling. Um, it's happening in another province. There's no reason it can't happen here. And we already have a program that was made to fit into the curriculum. It would be as easy as dropping it in tomorrow. Um, so uh, the goal of this is it's a relatively easy access thing and it's to teach people those safe cycling skills um, in an empowering 
uh, way. So we work with kids. Um, and then over the years, we've adapted that program uh, to a bigger audience, but I'll talk about those more later. We also just put it up online. We have these very fun online safe cycling videos. There's six of them. Maybe we'll make some more. Um, they kind of go over those things. They were designed in the pandemic to be fast and engaging, uh, but also giving those visual things. Um, uh, they're available in English, French, Arabic, and Mi'kmaq currently, and maybe we'll get some funding to do them in other languages as well. I can send links along. They're very fun, or you can um, find them on the EAC uh, YouTube channel. Um, yeah, and I think I, I will uh, take note that we were called out for not having better representation of uh, different types of bicycles. And so if we make another one, we'll be sure to include that in there as well. But one of the important things here was that we did want to show people from different backgrounds, different ages, just different gender expressions uh, so that we aren't just getting uh, white middle-aged men on bikes, which is a lot of the safe cycling videos. So it's important that people could see themselves. Um, Back to, uh, so more of our programming through Welcoming Wheels has been around it since 2015. Uh, this was the program that I originally coordinated for four and a half years. Um, I, this was a response to the uh, influx of Syrian refugees uh, into Nova Scotia. And so originally the concept behind it was let's give everyone bikes. Um, so uh, once we started with that, working with ISANS, with the Immigration Services of Nova Scotia, we realized that it was not just Syrian refugees who wanted bikes, it was a lot of newcomers. And so the program has been running strong since 2015. We're over 600 bikes, I believe, at this point that we have given away to newcomers, youth and uh, adults alike. Um, the program has also changed and evolved, again, as we made those relationships and we talked to people and, and heard from them. Um, so one of the big pieces is our bike buddy program where we pair locals with newcomers and the idea is that they go for a ride once a week um, for three months. Um, and people love this program. And again, it's not just about the bike, it's about community, it's about networking. And again, that like one on one piece that is a bit deeper than spending an hour in a parking lot teaching people hand signals. Um, so we've had really, really great outcomes from the bike buddy program. And it's kind of this narrowing down um, to uh, really doing having fewer participants in a program but spending a lot more time um, uh, and engagement and then watching those folks go out into their community, teach their families, teach their neighbors um, and send people back to us. So this idea of uh, creating champions within communities uh, has been really exciting to watch. Um, we also do have our earn a bike program where people come into the space and fix bikes with us, um, which has also been very fun uh, and rewarding over the years as well. Um, bike Again is technically under the Ecology Action Center's umbrella. It is a volunteer run do it yourself repair space so people can bring their bikes in and, and learn to fix them themselves. Um, and then there's also lots of bikes there. So lots of activity there going strong for 20 23 years, um, uh, lots of really wonderful work. Um, coming out of this, uh, this was supposed to pilot in 2020, it uh, hit some obvious uh, bumps, but one of the big pieces of feedback that we received from folks was that it was really hard to get um, onto the peninsula to get your bike fixed uh, or even to bike again um, if you lived basically anywhere off of the peninsula or if you did any kind of shift work. And so we were hearing from lots of people that their bikes were broken and that they couldn't afford to fix them or couldn't even get to a bike shop period. So we piloted this program, the pop-up bike hub, which is a 17 foot trailer uh, that we retrofitted into uh, what we sometimes call a bike again on wheels. And the idea again of going to communities to help people fix their bikes as opposed to trying to get people to haul their broken bike onto a bus and lug it out to us on a very specific night. <laughs> uh, so the pandemic threw some wrenches in there, but actually there was some really nice silver linings, which is that we created a partnership with the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. We went to every single mainland Mi'kmaq um, municipality in 2020, and we've gone back uh, for the last two years and also expanded up into Cape Breton with all of the Mi'kmaq communities up there. Again, same problem, folks in rural communities who don't have access, um, uh, that you know, you're know you looking at an hour or two hour drive to get your bike to a bike shop um, when all that's wrong with it is that the 
tires are low on air and your brakes are squeaky. Um, so trying to bring that that education and those tools and parts and then building capacity within communities. Um, same thing, we also still work with within HRM uh, with some of the Moscow Albert Harbor, um, Dartmouth North, Spryfield and Clayton Park communities, but then also very tactical outreach with um, some of the African Nova Scotian communities and other uh, newcomer focused communities. Pictures of my coworkers fixing bikes. Sorry, let's just give everyone a second there because they lovely pictures. Um, Pop-Up Mini is the offshoot of the offshoot, um, which is an e-cargo version, e-cargo bike version of the Pop-Up Bike Hub. So it's an even smaller version of that. We try to stay within 45 minutes of HRM by bike. Um, but again, we have summer students who work with this and they go around and do basic bike repairs and maintenance um, very specifically with, within uh, kind of targeted communities. Um, super fun, really empowering. And again, that, that barrier that like sometimes it's just a flat tire and that's what's preventing someone from riding their bike and so we can fix that fast. Um, we have an e-bike program uh, called Easy Ride where we work with businesses to train their staff. People could keep the bike for a month um, which we found initially as e-bikes were kind of like coming out and gaining popularity that it's a big financial commitment and people having the ability to have an e-bike for a period of time help them kind of realize whether or not it was a good fit for their life, uh, but also encouraging businesses to consider purchasing e-bikes instead of, um, uh, you know, work vehicles or like having an e-bike in the office that their staff needs. So we're still very excited about that program. Um, we continue to have our one meter magnet um, campaign now available in French, English, Arabic, and Mi'kmaq. Um, those, we're running another campaign right now to try and get businesses to start putting them on their vehicles. Um, and uh, one day I hope, I don't know, to see them all on the HRM um, police cruisers. I think that would be a very interesting message. Uh, but yeah, it, they're, 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 uh, we're, we're aggressively handing them out right now. Um, so I did say policy work. Um, currently right now, this is uh, the provincial uh, bill. It's the only thing that mentions uh, bikes. Uh, so this is in the environmental goals Climate Change Reduction Act. Uh, we were excited that it's in there. Um, so they're working right now to, the part one is to establish a provincial AT transportation strategy um, to increase active transportation options by 2023. So that is happening. Um, I believe Elizabeth Pugh is here. She's on that team who's, uh, they've hired a consultant and that will be happening. And the EAC and Bicycle Nova Scotia, since Brittany is not here, are aggressively standing in the wings, not in any way, shape or form silently because we've already submitted our feedback and recommendations of things that we'd like to see in there. Um, uh, and then that second part, which is the complete core active transportation networks that are accessible for all ages and abilities in 65% of the province's communities by 2023 uh, is that second part that again, an accountability piece of uh, what's it gonna take for us to get there. So that will hopefully be also part of the strategy. Um, Another piece of the work that my colleague Ben Hammer works on is actually tracking, like, what does this mean um, when they throw out numbers like 60% um, and then what it takes to get there. And I, I share this, HRM has the integrated mobility plan and then there's other works going on. Um, but for a lot of municipalities around the province, um, they don't have plans. They don't have a wonderful staff of AT planners. So we've created these three maps. I can share the link afterwards. Um, but basically the first map shows which communities have AT plans and which ones don't have AT plans, which is obviously the first step that you need to have before you can even start talking about infrastructure. Um, then we have a map of all the proposed infrastructure. It's color coded by type of trail. Um, and then there's a map of implementation status, um, which is, uh, you know, what's being planned, what's built um, and what's under construction. And so again, this piece of, a monitoring tool that is publicly available. So that is also on the EAC's website. Um, as an accountability thing, there's a very fun video that uh, exists on the internet, but given the time, I'm not gonna dig into it. Um, but if you want to, it's one minute long and it kind of talks through how to use the maps. Um, we also still have our active alliance, um, which the EAC kind of leads, it's a little bit, defunct at the time, but we can get our back up on our feet, which is basically a team of um, stakeholders, 
um, uh, coming to, together to kind of create resources and share things and also kind of talk about um, some of the barriers. Um, so there's a website, it's got a bunch of great information on there. Um, yeah, and then these are how I usually end my slideshow, but I'm not gonna dig super deep into it. But I think oftentimes we're very people focused. We're very interested in growing and deepening impact. Um, food, uh, which is that, uh, you know, that piece of building community. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Uh, and then I did also want to throw out, this is relatively new, but we are working on a project right now too, which is around um, accessibility. I have a student who's putting together my, our first little draft, um, but doing some first person story sharing um, about different uh, perspectives and um, barriers that folks face who live with varying disabilities um, in an in empowering and first person uh, story. So we're kind of working on a little project now uh, that hopefully will be going up and we'll be putting a team together to actually create it, but we're in the process of, of thinking about it, which I think is useful to share with folks. So if anyone wants to talk to me about that, I'm always available to have coffee or tea. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a, a big overview of our work um, and I'm sure I miss stuff, but generally speaking. Okay, Annika, thank you very much. And uh, you managed to get uh, get through within 20 minutes, which we try to uh, enforce. <laughs> so that's great. Um, let's go through the speaker list and give people a chance to uh, respond. So um, Holly Woodhill. Holly? Uh, I don't really have a comment at this time, but I might call Annika at another time. Very good, thank you. Uh, Milena Casanovicius. Uh, Annika, Milena. that was amazing. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I just had uh, one question. Uh, the, the bike again, is that free to the users? Uh, yeah, so it's uh, it used to be like by donation, but uh, we've managed to receive enough grants that we we don't ask for even that anymore. So if people want to buy secondhand parts, but like we charge like, you know, like three dollars for a new pair of pedals or something like that. So we just have piles of parts and tools and people are welcome to come in and use the space. And so, yeah, no. Uh, and also on Sundays, not every Sunday, there is a trans femme and non-binary hours as well, which are, uh, I'm usually there during those hours and it's very chill. That's wonderful. That's, a, that's amazing work. And you, can you put me on your newsletter emailing list, please? And thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, Melina. Um, Elizabeth Pugh. No, no real comments. Just uh, keep it up. You guys do great work. Okay, thank you. Peter Zimmer. Uh, first off, a great big thank you, Annika. That was a wonderful presentation. Inspires me if I didn't need more inspiration. Uh, yeah, there, there's lots that the cycling and active transportation and disabilities communities have to get together on. I was just thinking as I was watching this thing and about giving away bikes. Well, how much, how many bikes could you give away if you had the money that the province was going to drop into one kilometer of widening one of the hundred series highways? I think, you know, we could probably get about half the population of Nova Scotia on two wheels. Just a thought. Uh, it's where they spend. I've had that. Uh, yeah, I, you know, those are uh, in my unabridged notes uh, that we try and put more tactfully, but we will be making some comments on the public works capital uh, uh, <clears throat> budget that just came out. So stay tuned for that. There'll be some public statements coming. Okay. Come back to HCC and talk to us about endorsing what you're talking about. Okay, Peter, thank you. Uh, Andrew Taylor. Andrew, no comments? Uh, Paul Young. I, I do have comments. I just- uh, Oh, sorry, Andrew. Slow on the trigger. Um, Annika, I'm um, sorry, yeah. I am chair of the 
Accessibility Advisory Committee, and uh, I'm very interested in a couple of your projects that you've got going on. So perhaps we could uh, meet sometime and have a discussion about the accessibility part that you're uh, beginning to undertake. Yeah, and we're trying more to do amplifying because we do know that there's lots of other folks out there doing good work. Um, and that is one thing that we're good at is amplifying things out to a big audience. Uh, so uh, not looking to recreate wheels, but yeah, let's uh, grab coffee sometime. I'd love to chat and Sounds like I'm always, always open for feedback. <laughs> Excellent. All right, that's it for me. Okay, Andrew, thank you. Um, Paul Young. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Annika. That was a really interesting uh, presentation. Uh, a lot of those um, programs are news to me. Again, I've, I've been in Halifax now for about four years, but many of those were COVID years. So, um, so uh, you know, some of those programs might have been a little more subdued. Um, uh, I think I will be dropping you a line. I, I see if there's something I can do to help um, uh, with, with some of those programs. Um, but one of the things that I'm wondering about is uh, more publicity, amplification of your own, tooting your own horn, so that other people know, uh, you know, what programs are there uh, for them. Um, is that something in the works, a little more self-promotion somehow? Yeah, it's uh, the one thing we're really bad at is telling people what we're doing. Today is uh, uh, an attempt at rectifying that. <laughs> um, but also we are we're hiring a student this summer whose job is going to be doing communication stuff for us. So um, hopefully we'll have a little bit better presence. Uh, some stuff, yeah, during COVID, there was some stuff that we were very intentionally quiet about. So a lot of the pop-up bike hub work, um, we weren't um, telling people about because the communities didn't want people coming into their communities from the outside. So we were very, very, very intentional with only doing local um, sharing, uh, which which was a, a, a piece, but hopefully this summer we're gonna start talking a little bit more, at least about the work generally, not necessarily sharing exactly where we are when we're in communities. <laughs> Excellent. I wonder if I could maybe take one more comment. I'm sorry. I know I'm yeah. just blathering. Um, one of the things, one of the comments that that was there is if there was enough money, then the organization could buy enough bikes for everyone in Nova Scotia. Um, I believe that there probably is enough bikes in Nova Scotia, but they're not distributed the way that they could be. Um, and I think with the, you know, with so many people buying e-bikes, there's going to be a lot of pedal bikes available um, sitting in people's garages. And that might be a message that you might want to include to get out there to, you know, increase stock to redistribute those uh, bicycles to people that um, really want to use them. Just a thought and I'll, I'll yeah. leave, leave it there. Thanks a lot. Great presentation. Yeah, I think uh, that's that piece definitely with the pop-up bike hub that we've discovered is that there are a lot of people who want bikes and have a bike and they think their bike is broken and it's not actually um it's, they're not actually broken. They're they're actually they take five minutes to get back up and like rolling again, uh, rolling and breaking. Those are our two key features. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so it's it's that piece and definitely what. Oh, sorry. One of the things is uh, um, uh, we have there is no shortage of bike donations. Okay, I uh, I just uh, saw that um, David McIsaac has a comment to make. Uh, thanks, you. I, I kind of intended that to be after the committee has spoken, so maybe you're at that. But anyway, I just wanted to offer up my praise and appreciation for the work that Annika and her colleagues are doing. I think um, the hard stuff, which is the infrastructure, is obviously important, but what we sometimes call the soft stuff, which is the promotion and education work, is critical. Um, I love you know, the community-based work. I love the diversity of the folks that, that Annika and her colleagues are working with. Um, HRM is supporting that, and I would love to support it more with less red tape administration. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's really lucky in Halifax to have this going on. Very good. Thank you, David. Um, and I, I suspect both the uh, 
Doug Wetmore and myself will uh, will echo that. But um, Douglas, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, nothing beyond, as you said, echoing what David just said. That was a fantastic presentation and your whole team is doing excellent work there. Um, I will try to keep an eye out for events happening in the area and hopefully we'll see you on the ground. Thank you. Very good. Uh, and again, thank you, uh, Annika. Um, that was a, a very useful presentation and, and it suggests that um, some of the other um, user groups that are part of ATAC um, may also wish to uh, inform us of their work. Uh, so that's something to think about uh, if you want to bring a presentation to the group. So we'll move forward to um, item 9.2.2, which is a discussion um, that I'm suggesting on the terms of reference for the committee. Um, and uh, I believe for this, I should step down as chair, but and Douglas can take over, but I am the person who will introduce the topic and lead the discussion. So Douglas, if, if you want to take over as chair. Absolutely, thank you, Hugh. Um, I suppose. Okay. Okay, so. I will open the floor for Hugh to start his presentation. Okay, fine. So I'd I, I am suggesting this because uh, I actually only recently became aware that um, the terms of reference were changed in 2019. And when I joined the committee, I actually was provided with the 2015 terms of reference. And there are some differences. One being that the number of councillors on the committee has been reduced from three to one. Um, and there may have been a few other minor changes. So you were all circulated with the terms of reference, the new 2019 terms of reference. Um, I just want to quickly um, advise or remind you of the mandate of the committee. It's to advise the Transport Standing Committee, Transportation Standing Committee of Council on all matters relating to active transportation in HRM uh, using the active transportation plan as a guide. So it's, the committee is specifically charged with looking at active transportation. And there is a clear definition of active transportation in the terms of reference. Uh, it's any form of self-propelled mode of transportation that relies on the use of human energy. Um, and I know Peter Zimmer in the past has suggested that we expand uh, the committee's mandate to include all forms of micro mobility, uh, which would include e-bikes, e e-scooters uh, and, and the like. Um, and that's something we could look at. Uh, it would, it, a change of that nature would require um, a recommendation to the Transportation Standing Committee and a change by council. And I'm just wondering if that's even necessary given that we are re already considering how micromobility in general relates to active transportation in particular. We did that uh, quite recently, in fact. Um, so that's one item. Some, something though, I, I specifically, I'd like to ask you for your feedback to the following questions. Firstly, do staff involve us early enough in the planning of specific projects in the more conceptual stage, if you like, and the 30% stage of planning? Secondly, do we interact with and inform the Transportation Standing Committee to a sufficient extent. Um, we are required to, to do an annual report, which I guess uh, I will have to do very shortly for this year. Um, but beyond that, um, we're, we're not actually relating directly to the Transportation Standing Committee. We're not making specific recommendations to them. And we certainly, have the power to do so. Thirdly, do we make sufficient use of our ability to form subcommittees? Um, we are required to have a standing subcommittee for bike week. And uh, I don't know whether that standing 
committee is even operational. Um, I've not heard anything about that. Uh, but we're also able to set up um, other uh, subcommittees if we wish. And that's something uh, you might want to consider. So why don't I, with those questions in mind, let's, let's just hear from you about how you feel the committee is operating and whether you feel it, our operation can be improved in any way. Um, I'm going to go through the speakers list again, um, and there will be a chance to come back later. But let's let's go through the list. Elizabeth Pugh, do you have any comments to make? I feel like I should, but I really don't. Um, I often kind of wonder exactly what our purpose is and if we're achieving it. But I find this committee so interesting that I'm not sure if I really care, um, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's really useful for me in my work to to know what's going on with HRM and you know some of these issues that come up that have got provincial uh, jurisdiction because it's it's just kind of nice for me to be able to sort of say yeah you know there's an awful lot of people talking about this speed reduction stuff and, instead of you know people sitting in their little provincial bubbles. Um, but in terms of how we actually help council and help the standing committee, I've I've always been a little fuzzy on that because it does seem that depending on who's in the chair seat and who's on the committee that how this committee works changes um, over the years. Um, so I, I'll just sit back and, and hear what other people have to say, I think. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Peter Zimmer. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, my opinion, I'm a disturber. I want to make things change about the city. And I also pay attention to the future. And the future includes a lot of electric scooters, some shared, some not, a lot of e-bikes, some two-wheeled, some three-wheeled, even some four-wheeled. Um, they have to have some place to ride, whether it's in the streets or in the bike lanes or, you know, God forbid, on the sidewalks, because some people do. Um, I think we are seeing a whole shift in kinds of technologies that are micro mobility. People moving with the minimum kind of gear, a two wheeled scooter, a three wheeled uh, pedal bicycle or an e-bike. And the evidence from other cities is that this whole electrification has been making a real change in the demand for space on the street for cars. That they change how cities exist. And you also, by promoting these e-bikes, bring many more cyclists onto the road. And they have opinions about what's the proper balance of spending and attention. Um, so I think we have to, we have to be, we're a forum. We, are public. Uh, our meetings and excerpts from our meetings are available streaming online afterwards. I think we should make use of that and try and try and reach out and maybe get a YouTube audience or you know use social media in some way that reaches out and talks past just our committee meeting. We have a lot of good ideas, a lot of good energy comes to this this forum um i'd like to i'd like to see us grow up i would like to challenge the um uh, the standing traffic uh, transportation committee and city council to pay attention really to micro mobility and the changes that are coming down the road we can see them plainly happening in cities all over north america more importantly, all over Europe, and sometimes we can look to other parts of the world, um, we should learn and grow. I mean, we, we have to stop just talking empty words as the mayor has done. Oh, we're going to be the greatest cycling city in North America, he said on the mayor's bike ride last year. Um, I call bullshit. <laughs> I mean, it's, I'm sorry. It's, it's a aspirational image 
without substance. Um, it's where the rubber meets the road that we're going to see it. And I'm all about meeting the road um, to mostly human power. But I'm 80. I've got two bad knees and a bad ankle, uh, titanium knees now. But I'm going to be on a knee bike, hopefully for another couple of decades. Um, okay. Peter, I'm going to uh, thank, thank you because um, I am I, I I am hoping people will will speak directly to our current terms of reference and how how we are operating with regard to those. Um, so I, I understand your your broader vision and your longer range vision, but it's currently outside of our terms of reference to do some of the things you're suggesting. Um, well, I'll leave it at that. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, Paul Young, do you have con concerns or questions? Okay, I've been I've jotted a couple quick things, and I, I will be quick. Um, um, go, um, I think it's a really good idea to to ask ourselves, you know, have that moment and think about where where we're going and are we getting there. Um, so I'll get a couple of points. First of all, I really appreciate the progressive thinking that goes around the table at this meeting, and I really there there's so many different perspectives. Um, and people are uh, elaborate them really well, so I really appreciate that. That's nothing to do with, that's just a general point. Um, I do believe that we should expand the mandate to, to include the electrific electrified uh, beasts. If we're talking about e-bikes, they would fit underneath our, uh, they would mostly fit underneath our mandate already, but scooters would not, and I think that they should. So I totally agree, and I think that that's worth making a change for. Um, the next thing is, is a really good point is, you know, what, what about tangible results? And I, I like your point there, because if we're going to take all this time and, and make comments, I, I would like to have, you know, perhaps they ought to be, whatever recommendations should be landing in our minutes, they should be going to, you know, our governing committee, and I'd like to see some feedback. I think, it, you know, if we don't get feedback from them, What's the point? So there needs to be, if we're gonna make comments, we need to send to them and we need to hear back. Um, and the last comment I had, and this is you know just, just one of those re reflective type things is, is um, and I don't know if you guys have talked about this before, the pandemic seems to be winding down. Is it time to meet in person? It, is that, would people be interested in that? I, I, I think that there would be some very interesting discussions uh, before and after the meetings, which are really fruitful. So just a thought. Um, so yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for, Hugh for uh, making us think about these things. I think it's brilliant. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, Andrew Taylor, your comments? Yep, no comments. Okay, Andrew, thank you. Uh, Annika Ropel. Uh, yeah, I think I'm generally going to echo what other people are saying. I certainly would love to utilize some of those recommendations to get uh, up to the trans uh, transportation uh, committee. Um, so all in favor of that um, and uh, doing some strategical thinking, um, you know, subcommittees, et cetera, so forth. Okay, thank you. Um, Holly Woodhill. Holly? Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, in reviewing the, the documents, there seems to be a disconnect about from what I witnessed so far, and I'm new, between what we're supposed to be doing and what we should be doing, and I'm um, all for for all hands on deck and getting very active. Um, I retire in the end of July, so I'm going to be available. And I can be a pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, um, is that it? Uh, yeah, you, that's you're about just it. Warning it. You're just yeah, warning Yeah, I'm just it. warning you. <laughs> okay. Milena Casnavicius. Um, thanks, Hugh. <clears throat> Would you mind just repeating the, the first question again, please? Oh, just a moment. 
do staff involve us early enough in the planning of specific projects? Um, I think David McIsaac is is doing um, uh, a very good job on on majority of the projects. I, I will say, um, you know, we almost missed this meeting, and I there was there were things that were missing. This this committee, I would encourage this committee to share more information prior to all meetings, as Douglas did with his video. Um, Holly's phenomenal extensive list of things that are happening. Um, I would like to see that happening. I've been fortunate enough because I'm with Walk and Roll under the direction of Bill Campbell that I've sat in a lot of uh, stakeholder meetings um, that are at the 30%. I don't think we're getting enough. And I understand, Dave, that you're very busy um, and you bring forth what you can, what you're permitted to address. One. Um, two, I think your second question, Hugh, was, um, are, uh, are we, do, go ahead. Do we interact sufficiently with and inform the Transportation Standing Committee? That is a hard no on my part, um, as this is my second term. Um, I recall, I think we, we, in the first two years, submitted one, definitely I can remember potentially two recommendations to the Transportation Standing Committee, and I, I can't remember what the projects were. Um, I really like what Paul had said. I think we need a little bit more extensive notes to be sent to Transportation Standing Committee, and whether this is even permitted or not, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe that's for Elizabeth to answer. I, I don't know, but um, I would like to see some some responses back from the transportation standing committee because this is all of our volunteering times we are telling to the presenters um from hrm of what is happening you know i i have lots to say we've all lots to say and aside from other committees i'm on whether this is getting to the transportation standing committee or not there is no answer to that so i would agree with paul that i i really think we should somehow engage in sending notes and, and requesting um, replies from the Transportation Standing Committee. And I think the third one was the subcommittees. Uh, honestly, I, I, I don't think I even saw that, no pun intended, um, that we should be having subcommittees. Um, so I, I have I have no I have no res no response or reply for that, um, but if if that is under our mandate and we need to do that, you know, then uh, those are our mandates and that therefore we should be participating, but not just for biking, for all active yeah. transportation. End yeah, of that. To, thank uh, you. Yeah, thank you. J yeah. Just to clarify, uh, we yeah. are required to have a standing bike week week subcommittee which as far as I can tell, we don't have currently, but yeah. with regard to any other subcommittees, that's totally up to us whether or not we want to create those. Okay. Okay. I was just going to um, jump in there and suggest that I was just taking a look at the terms of reference here and it's, excuse me, saying that the bike week subcommittee um, is a permanent subcommittee. So um, since I know that is, I believe, the first week of June, I was going to suggest we maybe have a discussion around who would want to form the subcommittee for Bike Week this year. I think it's three to four members. I I just, uh, is Bike Week still a thing? Because it's changed. Um, uh, it was a month long for a while. And then, uh, so I, I feel like that is also a question. Is Bike Week a thing? Um, and do we need to have a committee? <laughs> um, I'm just speaking with Krista here, and she's saying that as far as she knows, it is still a it's still a thing. Okay. Uh, this is Melena. Just just to to interject here as well, I, I I believe I've seen that kind of stuff coming from our bike mayor Jillian Jillian, her and I are friends, so I, I think I think they're pretty active on that as well. But I, I'm not. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not naying this. Um, and you know, um, it was a bit of a surprise to me. So end of thought. Thank you. Um, I see that, uh, David McIsaac has a comment to make on bike week. David. Yeah, sure. So we, and I, we, I discussed it with th this committee three years ago 
we put a pause on bike week in 2020. And we had already decided to try something different before the pandemic, but then the pandemic really kind of, um, obviously uh, we couldn't have public gatherings and that sort of thing. And so right now we do not have any plans for bike week this year. Um, what we've been doing instead or trying to do is to sort of, I guess what, what we found is we were putting so much time and energy into bike week that we weren't doing like a broader kind of approach to education and promotion. And so what we decided to do, and we took it to this committee uh, three years ago, was to do things like supporting the work that the Ecology Action Center is doing and some of the education promotion activities that, that Chloe and uh, Eliza Jackson have been involved with um, in the past couple of years. So right now there is no bike week scheduled uh, for 2023. But if one option I would just put out to the committee is that we have a subcommittee on education and promotion around all of active transportation. I know we would have to change the terms of reference for this, but that might be one way of, of, um, of uh, framing it going forward. And if the committee wants us to have a bike week, then you know, we can talk about that as, as well. Okay, David, uh, I like your suggestion. Um, and I think uh, maybe we, this is something we could put on the agenda for next time is the, the suggestion or the, the possibility of forming a promotion and education subcommittee. Um, I hope uh, people would agree with putting that on the agenda for next time. Okay. Um, so let's just conclude uh, with Douglas and myself uh, with comments. Douglas Wetmore. Yes. So I think that this committee is really fortunate in that we've got a lot of people coming from different experiences, different backgrounds. And I feel like the discussions we have here are really valuable and very insightful. But unfortunately, the conversations tend to start and end at this committee. And aside from the staff who take our feedback and occasionally put that into plans and make revisions based on our feedback, I feel like these conversations don't really go elsewhere, which is really unfortunate and kind of a waste of a lot of potential. I, just based off the three points that you've brought up tonight, I think the biggest thing that we probably want to look at is a disconnect between this committee, this committee and the transit standing committee. Um, as a lot of other members have already said, I think there'd be some great opportunities to not just have them listen in more and really hear the conversations that we have and hear the different perspectives and insights, but actually have an opportunity to get some feedback from them, hear their responses, have members of the transit standing committee actually give us feedback and comment on the ideas that we bring forward. I think just that alone would help remove that disconnect and help us kind of have a little bit more guidance in directing the transit standing committee. That's at least my big picture of it. I would honestly love to have more conversations around this. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Douglas. Um, I actually agree with you that um, we do need, just based on what we're supposed to be doing, we are supposed to be advising the Transportation Standing Committee. We also, of course, advise staff. And I agree that, in fact, our relationship with staff seems very good. Yeah. The, the staff, staff relationship is excellent. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the real, the real issue, I think, is that um, we're, so we're not in a vacuum uh, because, you know, our, our advice is, I think, taken seriously by staff. On the other hand, Transportation Standing Committee is the committee that actually reports directly to council. It's the one that has the power to actually do things. We can only recommend. So 
my feeling is we actually should make more specific recommendations directly to the Transportation Standing Committee. The issue there is any specific recommendation would have to be voted on by this committee and would, we'd need agreement on this committee, obviously, uh, before we make a specific recommendation to TSC. But um, I think this has been a useful um, look at our terms of reference. And uh, I think we can all go away and think about uh, the comments that were made. And uh, I'm, there is certainly some agreement on several, uh, several aspects. So may unless... I make a comment to you? Sure. Yes, please. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I am not an expert on this stuff at all, but I remember having this conversation probably when the things were revamped back in 2019. And I think we need to be careful because while we're advisory committee, I don't think we have the authority to bring up an issue and take it forward. I think the issue needs to originate from the standing committee on something that they want our advice on. Now, Elizabeth can correct me if I'm wrong. We've had so many staff changes on this you know, committee since I've this little bell that's going off. Um, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the comments. Uh, um, but that was my understanding, and, and maybe we can get that clarified. Um, and in, in which case, I think what we need to do is really make the case to the standing committee that we are here. Um, please use us. Because, again, this is where I find I, I'm a little confused because I, I often feel like we're just an information exchanging group. And, and does anybody actually want our advice and, and ask for our advice? So, Yeah. Just on looking at the, the mandate, it does say the committee will provide timely advice to the Transportation Standing Committee uh -huh. on matters relating to budget, infrastructure, education, policy and public awareness. So it's a question of how you read that. Is it up to us to suggest when it's timely to give advice or do we have to wait for TSC to come to us? Um, maybe we I can am get a Sorry to interrupt there. I'm just looking at the mandate. It says if the issue falls within mandates uh, under the transportation plan, um, it says they can discuss and make recommendation. It looks like you can um, make recommendations to the Transportation Standing Committee without um, the Transportation Standing Committee asking uh, the committee to speak to that issue. Very good. And, and that's the way I would read it too. Otherwise, yeah. we, we really are in a vacuum. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so oh. certainly, I, I think let's all bear that in mind going forward. That uh, if we want to re-establish links with the TSC, we really do need to initiate discussions among ourselves and then make recommendations forward to the TSC. Mr. Chairman, well, interrupt just for a second. If yeah. I could just ask the committee to uh, one, actually, I think I, I heard on the chat that uh, um, Dave Dave has a comment to make as well. But if if we don't mind, just um, you know, saying who's speaking, and um, I get most of the voices. Um, but if you know, before you speak, if you could just say, especially when our chair is not calling by name, that I would appreciate as a person who's blind. Um, just to keep that in mind, I'm smiling. Thank you. Thank you, Melena. Yeah, yes. that's a, a good reminder. Thank you. Um, anyone else have any qu <laughs> uh, final comments before we close our meeting? Uh, okay. you, it's, it's David McIsaac here. I just have one suggestion, and that would be to invite Councillor Mason to um, to have this. He's the chair of the Transportation Standing Committee. He's also been around for a long time, and uh, he might have some useful suggestions about, you know, how this committee could interact uh, in a different okay. way with, with transportation standing. Okay, so perhaps that's a good suggestion. Perhaps um, maybe I could have a conversation with him um, and invite him to, to our meeting. Does that make sense? Hopefully. I think so. That, yeah. I yeah mean, and that uh, was Way Mason, right? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. Um, well, we are just about out of time. There are no added items um, in our agenda. The date of the next meeting is April the 20th. 
Um, and um, so please make a note of that. And I need a mover for adjournment. Melinda moves. Adjourn, thank you, please. Thank you, Melinda. <laughs> and we don't, we don't need a seconder for that. So thank you, everyone. And uh, I think we had a useful discussion. And don't go biking and drinking tomorrow, please. Stay safe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Good call That's out. Right.